Hi, thanks for joining us here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room. I'm here with uh, Capcom Hal Getzelman, and we are excited to take your questions. Hi, I'm Victoria, and my question today is what jobs and duties do you perform in mission control? So I'm a uh, capsule communicator, and uh, my job is to uh, talk to the crew on orbit. And uh, what I do is I listen to all the conversations that the experts are having here on the ground. And then I work together with the flight director and then explain it to the crew on orbit exactly what's going on and try to understand what they need to know and give that information in a way that's useful to them. What tests are they performing on the International Space Station for sending people to Mars? Well, we're performing a lot of uh, activities on board, and a lot of those will help us learn the skills and, uh, and test the equipment that we'll need. Uh, a good example is uh, exposure to radiation. Our crews carry around uh, dosimeters, little devices that measure their radiation exposure, and uh, we track that throughout the mission. Also, we have equipment on board that removes carbon dioxide. Uh, we have equipment that takes water and separates it into hydrogen and oxygen, so the crew will have something to breathe. We also are uh, uh, obviously put on board provisions of food and uh, clothing that they would, of course, need for their trip to Mars. So we are learning to live for uh, six months at a time. We're going to have one mission in the near future for one year uh, on orbit. And, of course, as you might suspect, to go to Mars is going to take us anywhere from a year to two and a half years around trip. So we need to get quite a bit of uh, experience in this, uh, in this uh, uh, regime. My name is Ethan. My question today is, how much does it cost to send a mission into space? Well, it costs a, a lot of money. Uh, when the space shuttle program was going on, it was about four and a half billion dollars a year uh, program itself. Um, but everything costs uh, an extraordinary amount of money uh, because we don't have the ability to go to the 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 corner hardware store to get spare parts and so all of our equipment has to go through rigorous uh, design and testing and uh, a lot of people get involved with that and so therefore it's very expensive so um, you're talking millions and billions of dollars to do things that uh, on earth would cost much less but because we're in space they do cost uh, a considerable amount of money but we should also add that we learn a lot from doing that, and there's a lot of technologies that we use on Earth in our everyday lives that have come from that investment in the things that we're developing for spaceflight. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of the technologies of min miniaturization, of uh, taking very large computers and shrinking them down to where we see today, that effort was all begun because we needed computers that were small enough to fit in our spacecraft to go to the moon and things like the cell phones that they use, smartphones, um, and even some of the sports equipment that probably some of you kids use have all sometimes have uh, derived from space technology. Thank you. All right, so my name is Jack, and I was wondering, what do you do with communication systems um, with um, permission to to the ISS? What do you do if they fail or not? Okay, so it's very important to us uh, that we can communicate with the crew, and we do that several different ways. One way is, of course, voice communications, where we are just talking back and forth. Another very important way is video, where we actually see the crew and see what they're doing, and we can observe where they're at in a particular, like an extravehicular activity, a spacewalk. Um, and also we get a lot of telemetry data that's coming down from the space station 
uh, so we can see the status of systems and all that. All that communication is very important to us. And so we have uh, quite a bit of redundancy in the system. So we have two separate strings of uh, equipment for the voice. We recently upgraded the communication system to allow voice through our uh, a different frequency band than what we were using before. So we actually have four different channels of communications we can talk to the crew. The Russian segment has its individual system of uh, VHF uh, communications. Um, so together we have quite a bit of redundancy. So if one system should fail, we can continue to talk to the crew in sort of a reduced, effective way, and then we can get it fixed. Well, that's a very good question because I'm sure uh, many of you have seen on television um, an asteroid that uh, came into the atmosphere over uh, a Russian city, and so it's getting a lot of thought. Um, in the space station, uh, we're able to track most large objects that are in orbit around the Earth, and any time that one of those known items is going to cl pass close to the space station, we try to move the space station out of the way. In other words, a day or two prior, we'll adjust the orbit by usually boosting it out of the way so that when that object passes, it passes well clear. Now, asteroids are a little different because they are not as well known and as well predicted. But what if we did know one was coming close, we could take actions to uh, maneuver the space station out of the way. Hi, my name is Allie. My question is, how are the satellites powered so long without having any force? And do you control any satellites from the station? Okay, well, again, that's an interesting question. Um, in most of our satellites that uh, orbit around the Earth, uh, they have solar panels, solar collectors, and that produces the electricity they need. Um, for further um, stability in that system, they also have batteries. And so the solar panels collect the electricity um, that's converted sunlight and charge up the batteries. And even when the satellites go in the shade of the Earth, because remember, as they are in orbit around the Earth, a lot of times, and the same with our space station, when we go on the side opposite the sun, we're in the shade. So we use the battery power for that. Some satellites, uh, uh, like the rover on uh, Mars, actually use nuclear power. And uh, they have a uh, isotope that is uh, fairly hot, and they use a thermocouple device to harvest that heat energy and convert it into electricity. So that's why they don't need the cords or anything. And I think the second part of uh, your question is, we don't directly today control any satellites from the space station. We have launched a few small satellites, um, and the crew has released those from the space station. And they just, they're passive. They just orbit until they uh, re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. My name is Arisha, and my question to you today is what is the truth and how many years does it take to become an astronaut? Well, um, it starts uh, way back when, right when you guys are there. Um, all of our astronauts are excellent students, they're excellent learners, and they excel and thrive on learning and accumulating knowledge. And uh, they have uh, done that their whole life. Uh, most of our astronauts are in their 30s by the time they get selected to become astronauts. They're picked from a, a large pool of volunteers, um, and we're trying to pick the best candidates for those jobs. Um, and it doesn't, we have a lot of different uh, ideas. They're not all uh, test pilots. Some are doctors, some are geologists, some are oceanographers. So they come from a lot of different scientific and technical backgrounds. Um, 
once they're uh, picked to be an astronaut, it takes about a year and a half to do the basic training. And then they go on to advanced training, which probably will take another year uh, before they're assigned to a mission. And once they're assigned to a mission, it takes another two and a half years before they're actually uh, uh, on board the space station. So actually, you can see that's about five to six years of training uh, once they're selected as astronauts. Some uh, have been around as long as 10 years before they fly. And I think uh, part of the question what, what was, what does the training entail? And a lot of that, I think folks would be surprised, they have a lot of classroom training too. So it's just like you in school, there are a lot of times studying in a classroom setting um, with book studying, trying to learn the systems, the space station systems, how, how all the different uh, oxygen systems, thermal systems, all those things work. So some of it's similar to what you do. And then other times they're in a, a mock-up, which is kind of like a pretend space station. And that's where they're rehearsing the procedures and learning how to work with a team. Other thoughts, Hal? No, that's, uh, that's quite true. Um, and also, they have to do a lot of language training. Um, since our astronauts are working with Russian crew members and uh, mission control in Moscow often communicates in Russian, uh, they need a, uh, to be competent uh, Russian speakers. So um, another challenge for our astronauts. Hello, my name is Andy. My question for today is, since the all space shuttles have been decommissioned, how do you get su supplies, food, and people up in the space station? Okay, well that's a good question because obviously the crew cannot get by without food and water. And uh, we have several um, resupply cargo ships. Uh, we have the Progress, which is a Russian uh, cargo vehicle. We have the ATV, the Aryan Transfer Vehicle, which one was just launched out of French Guiana here yesterday. It's a very large cargo vehicle, it's bringing up a lot of food and water and spare parts. Um, we have the Dragon uh, space capsule uh, from a private firm of SpaceX. And the Cygnus uh, cargo vehicle will be coming up this fall sometime. And also we have the HTV, which is a Japanese cargo vehicle. So we have several cargo vehicles available to us to bring up that uh, food and water now that the space shuttle is retired. Our only vehicle to actually bring the crew up is a Russian-built vehicle called the Soyuz. It carries a crew of three. And we're hoping with commercial crew and with our Orion program to develop a new launch vehicle, uh, an American-built vehicle that can also bring crew up to the space station. Hi, I'm Annie. Um, what has been the most memorable or exciting moment for you two in the control center? Well, for me personally, um, you know, we have uh, sort of busy times and we have times that are not quite so busy. So I think of myself, the most uh, exciting time for me was when we brought up Node 3 and the cupola and we attached that to the International Space Station. That was the last major um, item that was going to be attached to the space station. There was a few other experiments and a, a, a sort of big closet that we brought up later, but this was the last big module. And to be part of that mission and see that the space, space station would finally be completed was a very exciting moment for me. It was kind of like seeing the, uh, the uh, Empire State Building or the Hoover Dam first become operational, finally finish its initial construction and be declared operational. So that was a very exciting time for me. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, Michael has told you guys the space station is as big as a football field. It's really, really huge and hard to imagine in space, but it had to be built piece by piece with different modules being flown up. Some of those modules were built in other countries and they were all brought up there individually and pieced together. So uh, for people like Hal who've worked on it for a long time and been a part of it to see it being built over years, it was probably a big deal to see it come together. And the cupola, of course, is a special piece because it has all the windows. So that's a favorite spot for the astronauts on the space station where they go and, and literally 
it's almost like going into a bay window where there's windows on every surface and they can look out and just see a wide, wide panor panoramic view of the earth. So it's a special place. Yeah, I think uh, back one of the books that uh, they had us read when we were young was uh, Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And his submarine had a big picture window in the front of the submarine. And, and so the cupola is kind of this big window that you get to look out at the earth below. And uh, I've had crew members tell me that uh, it has such an impact on them that it actually brings them to tears to look out that window. Hi, my name is Jordan, and my question is, what is everyday life in the command center and the space station? Well, every day is uh, a little different, as you might imagine. Um, but let me give you a thumbnail uh, sketch of what it's like. Uh, we operate on Greenwich Mean Time, and the crew gets up at about 6 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. Uh, for us, that's about uh, 1 o'clock or midnight here in Houston. So we bring in a, a control team. There's three control teams. We each work about eight-hour shifts uh, and hand over to the next shift. The crew gets up, uh, you know, does their normal things, of waking up and getting dressed and having breakfast and all that. We talk to them first thing in the morning, kind of tell them what's going on and, and any uh, important developments that may have happened while they were sleeping. And then they start into their uh, routine. Um, we work really hard to keep the crew busy, and we have them assigned tasks, uh, a basically a flow chart um, of the activities for the day, and the crew uh, works through those. Uh, we help them with that. Uh, we take actions on the ground to maybe save some equipment, turn it off before they change out a part or something like that, and they work through till about lunchtime. While this is going on, the crew actually has about two and a half hours of exercise during the day. They do uh, half of their exercise would be aerobic. That's like running or pedaling a bicycle. The other half is uh, strength training, and they do that on our resistive exercise device. And uh, so they, they work that into their schedule. After lunch, they have uh, more activities. Um, around about 3.30 in the afternoon, we kind of wrap up the, the work day for the crew, and uh, then they have a, uh, about an hour and a half to kind of have supper, get settled down, take care of their own uh, sort of interests, and then they go to bed for eight hours and get up and do it again. On the weekends, um, Saturday morning, they do a lot of house cleaning, vacuuming, uh, swabbing down areas of the, of the, uh, the, uh, the hull, and uh, inspecting things. Um, the rest of the s Saturday is usually uh, free time for what they want to do. Sunday, uh, uh, again, is another uh, kind of off day for them where they can spend some of their own time. And then we talk to them uh, Sunday night and give them uh, some updates on what will be happening the following week. So that's kind of a typical day. Um, you know, there are atypical days where we're doing spacewalks or we're having visiting vehicles come uh, and they'll reach out and grab them and pull them in. So those are kind of the special days. But uh, um, so I hope that answers your question. Hi, my name is Faisal. And how often do the astronauts aboard ISS reach out and get to come home? Well, currently our uh, average duration of the crew is about six months. You know, a few days less, a few days more, depending on uh, a few factors. Uh, we will have a crew coming up uh, uh, next year that will be up for a full year. And uh, that's just part of our uh, data gathering to see the effects on the crew uh, being in wait list for a full year, but typically just six months. Thank you. Have you ever had any emergency on board the ISS while you were working? Well, that's a good question because, uh, as you might imagine, we have very well developed procedures and actions, and we practice quite a bit for those occurrences. We've had quite a few false alarms, in other words, a smoke detector. Um, 
you know, will go off and will analyze the condition and decide that it was a faulty sensor or something like that. We've also had uh, what we thought was a contaminated atmosphere, uh, which was simply uh, baking out of a absorbing material that had some gunk in it, so to speak, uh, that smelled bad, but it turned out it was not really harmful to the crew. So no, I've not uh, actually been on when we've had a actual emergency, and uh, so far we haven't had any true emergencies on space station. Hi, my name is Joe, and my question is, what inspired you to do your job and work with NASA? Okay, well, when I was uh, in junior high school, um, the first Apollo mission was going to the moon, and uh, it was Apollo 8, and they flew a uh, racetrack around the moon. They didn't actually land, but they just flew around the moon, and they did that on uh, Christmas Eve. And so I can remember being with my family at a Christmas party at night, watching that on TV, and hearing from astronauts talking from the far side of the moon about their experiencing and reading from the Bible. And uh, I thought, boy, that's something I'd really like to do. And, uh, and so I kind of organized my life around um, preparing myself, studying, taking the courses, uh, uh, learning as much as I could uh, so someday I, I could be picked. Uh, I never was picked, but I, uh, I really enjoy working in the space program. Hi, my name is Duncan. <coughs> my question is how hard is the training to work at Mission Control? What schools and places did you have to go to, and what is your degree? Well, fortunate for, for me, I had a lot of experience in other jobs. Uh, I, I was a uh, fighter pilot in the United States Air Force for 20 years. I had graduated from the Air Force. So um, I, uh, I was well prepared for the job. Now, a lot of our folks who come and work in mission control are right out of college. And so um, it's a challenge to learn the precision of the business. In other words, um, sloppy work um, doesn't count for much here. Um, you don't get partial credit for making a good try. What we really want is results, and we want people who are really uh, focused on the important things of the job. So in that sense, um, if you're well prepared, it's not uh, that difficult, um, but it is a challenging program. There's a lot of information to learn, a lot of uh, facts and figures that you must be uh, uh, comfortable with, so it, it is a challenge for most of our uh, flight controllers. Hi, my name is Kendall. My question is, with communication being so far away, is it always easy to connect with ISS? Do you get glitch signals? Well, this is an excellent question, and uh, I just want to say that, like right now, we're having uh, a period of time where the sun is uh, at a very high angle over the station, and we're having some thermal problems with our KU antenna, big dish antenna that you'd like to see um, out on the outside of your house. And that antenna is getting too cold, so we can't use it right now. So we've not, we're not able to get video down and data up to the crew. So that's kind of a glitch. Um, every now and then we'll have uh, the comm will break up, and we have to say things twice and all that. But normally our communications is very clear and very reliable. But from time to time we do have problems. All right, and I understand that's our last question, but we want to thank you guys again for uh, taking the time to ask some questions and learn a little bit more about the space station, and thank Hal for uh, joining us. Thanks, guys. 
Hey, thanks very much. I'm sorry for the folks. I uh, need to answer a little quicker so we get everybody's in next time.